with your presence again. In Christ's name I pray. Amen and amen. All right. Ladies, Joseph, have a great day at Sunday school. We'll see you later for communion. Auntie Burrow and Auntie Rose is going to take you guys up. And Bailey's going to read our scriptures for us this morning. Yay, Bailey. The scriptures today come from the book of John, chapter 9, verses 1 through 11. A man born blind receives sight. As he walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed to him. We, might, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he has said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. His neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began, began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Thank you, Bailey. Thank you, Brendan. Can we thank Jack and our readers this morning, Brendan and Bailey? For... Yeah. You know, it's, it's because they do what they do, and all of our other volunteers they do what they do so well that we can enjoy our worship experience and, and it be meaningful to us, okay? So we just praise you guys through God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. Good morning again, okay? We are concluding our sermon series titled Questions I've Always Wanted to Ask God. And, and although we're, we're ending our series today, you know, I want to encourage you to keep asking God your questions. Keep searching for answers to those questions because it's in our interaction with God, it's in our wrestling with God that we grow, okay? It's been fun and an and, 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 and enriching series where we've asked God questions like, what does it mean to be saved, All right? What does faith have to do with our relationship with God? Why did Jesus die on a cross? Why do bad things happen to good people? And hopefully you have learned, hopefully you've been touched by God and you are being transformed into the image of Christ because that's why we're here this morning. That's why we gather on Sunday mornings because that's God's will for our life. That was another question that we looked at, right? And of all the questions that we've asked, in my opinion, today's question is the easiest to swallow but the hardest to digest, Sort of like if you're lactose intolerant and you eat ice cream, right? Yeah. <laughs> today's question, which brings us to today's question, is what's so amazing about grace? Everyone say that with me. What's so amazing about grace? That was pretty good, but I know you can do better. Let's try that again. What's so amazing about grace? And I borrowed that title from one of Philip Yancey's books titled What's So Amazing About Grace. So if you're intrigued... With this question, that would be a great resource for you to read and, and uh, get a better glimpse because he, he's such a prolific, he's a great writer. He, he'll really enhance and enrich what I'm saying here this morning, okay? So let me explain why I think grace is easy to swallow but hard to digest because in my opinion, the word grace is one of those Christianese terms you know, everybody understand what I'm talking about? Those Christianese terms like alleluia or um, repent. And, and although we adopt it into our vocabulary, like, do we really fully understand what those words mean? 
You know? The most common definition that I've heard for the word grace is God's unmerited favor, which means receiving something, right? A gift that we don't deserve, which is absolutely correct. But let me ask you, you know, how practical is that? Like, does that fully explain what grace is to you? For me, that definition just doesn't really give me a full picture of what God's grace really is. And, and maybe, and maybe, for me anyway, and maybe for some of you, it's, it's not so much that we don't understand the definition of grace, but rather we've been raised, we've been conditioned, we've been taught all our lives that we need to fend for ourselves, right? That we shouldn't rely on anyone else. Because when the going gets tough, the tough get going, right? Hard hard work pays off in the end because there is no such thing as a free lunch. There's no substitute for hard work. Everything costs something. The difference between ordinary and extraordinary is that little extra. Yeah, you guys know Genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration, right? Catherine's got every single one that I put out there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, in all our lives, we've been raised to do, do, and do, to work for everything, to achieve, to strive for our goals, to earn our own way. See, that's the work ethic that you need in order to be successful. And if you're Asian-American... On top of those expectations, you're supposed to be super smart in math. (laughs) You are. You know? You need to grow up to be a doctor or an engineer. You'd be good at tennis, play the violin, be a whiz on the computer, etc., etc., etc. And and whether we like it or not, for many of us, these, these stereotypes have shaped us. These expectations have defined who we are, defined our personalities and our character. That's what happened to me. You know? And even though I attended religion class in high school and was dragged to church every Sunday morning to hear that I needed Jesus, I didn't fully understand what grace was or what was so amazing about it. No, I was conditioned to reciprocate what was given to me, right? And, and to earn what I didn't have. So when I I finally was at a place and God, in His grace, opened my eyes that I could see and I could fully understand what was so amazing about His grace, I was literally speechless. And God is so good. He really is. Appropriately, appropriately, God taught me how amazing His grace is through a girl whose name was Grace. See, I was invited to a Bible study, and and during the Bible study, for whatever reason, it was probably because I was ungracious, Grace asked me, she she really questioned my, my salvation. She asked me, how do you know that when you die that you're gonna go to heaven? And when she asked me that question, I, I didn't have an answer for her. So, so I started telling her, I started explaining to her how good of a person I was. You know, I, I explained to her that all the good things that I did, that I followed the rules and that I volunteered at this and this organization and that I was a nice guy. And she just shook her head and, and she said, that's not how you get to heaven. You know, and, and I was floored. I was like, what do you mean? That's, how, that's what I thought you had to do in order to get to heaven. I was speechless. And, and after a long, awkward moment of silence, okay, I was like, so how do I get to heaven? I asked her, how do I get to heaven? Explain that to me. So she went on and explained that it's, it's only through Jesus Christ that we are saved. There's nothing that we can do to earn our salvation. It's a free gift from God that we're saved by grace, God's grace. And eternal life is a gift, and that's what makes it so amazing. 
And being Korean, that was hard for me to digest because all my life, I've been taught that I need to repay what's given to me to reciprocate every good deed, you know? And that's why I contend that grace is easy to swallow but hard to digest. And even though I can conceptually accept the fact that I'm saved by grace, see, my challenge, my challenge is to fully live in God's grace as expressed through my actions, So how do we? How do we do that? How do we live in God's amazing grace, especially when we've been conditioned, raised to earn everything we want in life? So let's take a look at today's reading in John chapter 9, okay, in our gospel, John chapter 9, to see if we can find some clues to do just that. Gospel of John is in the New Testament. Lynn said, eight, page 871. Okay, follow along as I read. Verse 1. As he walked along, he, Jesus, walked along, he saw a blind man, a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Okay, see, it's typical, typical of the situation. The Israelites, like many cultures in that area, even today, believe that if a person was born with dis- a disability, you know, those were the consequences of sin in their life or their parents' life, and that they were cursed by God. You know, it's what we would call bachi today, right? Good for you, right? You must have done something wrong. That's why you're suffering like that. See, but notice Jesus' response in verse 3. See, he says, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works. That word works is translated in in other um, Bible versions. The New Living Translation translates that word works as power. Okay? So, So that God's works, God's power might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. See, Jesus corrects his disciples' thinking. He says that, no, 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 you got it all wrong. This man is blind not because he has sinned or his parents has sinned. Okay? He's not blind because he's cursed. No. He's blind because life's not fair. Okay. Let that sink in for a little bit. Yeah. Our circumstances in life, the things that happen to us a lot of the times, even though we do all the right things and it still doesn't turn out, it's because life's not, sin and not fair because of our, the original sin of Adam and Eve. So when life's not fair, as Jesus is going to show, it's our opportunity as God's children, because Jesus being the son of God, the child of God, it's an opportunity to display, to manifest God's works, his power, or in other words, God's grace, his unmerited favor. And that's exactly what Jesus does. See, in verse 6, let's read. When he said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Then he, the blind man, went and washed and came back able to see. See, now that's grace. That's amazing. An unexpected, undeserved gift from God. Jesus didn't need to heal this blind man. He could have just kept going on his way, but he did so because that's God's kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. That's what it looks like, that the blind will see, that the lame will walk, that the lepers will be cleansed, that those of us who are in bondage to whatever it is will be free, that we would be changed forever. 
And that's what happened to this blind man. He was once blind, but now he was able to see. And the rest of the chapter describes the former blind man's earnest attempts to prove that he was who he was, who he, who he said he is, who he said he was, as he was questioned by the religious leaders. And, it, and it's pretty hilarious. So, so if you're unfamiliar with the story, please go ahead and read it on, um, by yourself later. See, the point of the story is, though, that, that God's grace, his unmerited favor, his undeserved gift changes us. And there's nothing we can do to earn it. That's why it's amazing. See, but like any gift that's given to us, we need to open it, right? If you're given a Christmas present and it sits in the closet, is it really a gift? No. It's an unopened present, but you're not appreciating it. And that's what the blind man does. He goes and he washes his eyes. He follows the instructions. He obeys what Jesus asks him to do. And, and what would that look like today for us? Well, with the time remaining, let me illustrate my point with a story about a guy I know. And let's just call him John with an H. J-O-H-N. Okay, John. Okay. I, I first met John while we were um, working at Sam Choi's breakfast, lunch, and crab together. You know, and although I was a waiter on the floor and he was a line cook, everyone, everyone knew John because you just couldn't notice him. You know, he, he was younger, must have been about 18 or 19 at the time. And the, and the reason why you couldn't miss him is because he was loud and obnoxious. And anybody know somebody like that? Yeah, yeah. He had an opinion about anything and everything, and he wasn't afraid to let you know his opinion. He was just constantly in your face about everything. Well, a few months later, to my surprise, I learned that we attended the same church, okay? And, and since the church had multiple services, and you know, I, I never saw him at church, but someone had mentioned it to me, a co-worker had mentioned it to me. And, and the reason I say that I was surprised is because from John's behavior, okay, I would never have guessed that he was a follower of Christ, that he was a Christian, that he had received Jesus as his Lord and Savior. Why? Well, let's just say that he was very ungracious. He was arrogant and obnoxious. So one day while eating our employee meals before our shift, you know, I, I sat next to him and I asked him about his faith. And I learned that, that he had been invited to an Easter service by his mother and that he had raised his hand to receive Jesus as his Savior. You know, and he was a smart kid and, and he could clearly articulate what he thought it meant to be saved. But as I mentioned, you know, his lifestyle testified otherwise. And then, then all of a sudden, John just dropped off the grid, nowhere to be found. You know, I heard some rumors that he had got into a fight and that he had gotten into some trouble, but, you know, I didn't think anything of it. Then four months later, I, I see this guy at church who kind of looked like John, you know, but something was different. It, it wasn't quite right. So as, I, as I'm walking and I'm approaching this, this guy, he, he sees me and then he calls out, hi, John. Puzzled, I'm like, like John, is that you? And, and like the blind man who Jesus healed, he confirms, yeah, it's me. I'm the man. I'm John. You know, and, and at first, you know, well, the first reason I didn't recognize him was because he wasn't loud and unruly, right? Instead, he, he was humble. He was very gracious. But the main reason I didn't recognize him was because he had, a, he had major reconstructive surgery done on his face. See, he, he told me the story that he had been in the hospital rehab for the past three months because he had been in a fight and he got beaten up really bad. And one night, as he explained it, one night after work, as usual, a bunch of the waiters and the cooks and then the staff went to a sports bar to drink, to play pool, to throw darts, and just unwind. 
Well, on this particular night, he was being his obnoxious self, as usual, and was flirting with one of the female bartenders. And she told him to stop because she had a jealous boyfriend who didn't like her talking to other guys. But John, being John, just kept pestering her. (coughs) Excuse me. (coughs) Well, the boyfriend eventually showed up. You know, saw John flirting with his girlfriend, and he exploded. You know, he called John out. He challenged him to a fight. And, and, you know, John's a pretty big kid. He's he's a little bit taller than me. You know, he played football in high school. Huskier, about 215 pounds. He would lift weights. So he was a good-sized kid, muscular. But being stupid, okay, he went outside. He says he remembers being hit a couple of times. And and then everything went black. Witnesses say that the boyfriend beat him to the ground and started kicking John in the face with his steel toe boot before they could pull him off. Okay. The boyfriend demolished John's cheekbone, his nose area, his jaw, and then the, the area around his eye, his right eye. And, and in the hospital, John was literally blind. He had lost his vision in that fight. You know, doctors told him that he most likely wouldn't recover, recover his sight in his right eye because of the damage. You know, obviously, he became depressed. You know, he had, but he had a lot of time to think and process the choices that he had made. And during that time, he was also visited by his mother's church friends, as well as a few pastors. And, and in their conversations, he expressed his bitterness. He expressed that he wanted revenge. Yet, in those darkest moments, he also saw a light. He heard the gospel again. The gospel that Jesus Christ came to reconcile us, the whole world, back into a relationship with God. That Jesus died for our sins that Jesus forgave us of our sins and asks us to forgive others as it is in heaven, so shall it be here on earth. And John realized that he, could, he literally could have died in that fight and that being alive was a gift from God. It was God's grace. He also learned what it meant to have a relationship with Jesus in the hospital. That it wasn't just about raising his hand and making a commitment, a one-time commitment, but no. Like any relationship, it takes time to build. You need to spend time with the other person to grow that relationship. It can't just be one-sided. And like the blind man in the story, he realized that He too was once blind, but now he could see, even though it was only out of his left eye. But this is, again, how good God is. Miraculously, through science and medical technology, uh, the advancements of medical technology, his doctor was able to restore sight in his right eye. Amazing grace. It was a gift. He forgave the bartender's boyfriend. He actually got to a point where he harbored no bitterness against him. John was just grateful that he was alive, that he had a second chance at life. And like the blind man, he understood that his ability to see was a gift of God's grace, God's unmerited favor, something that he didn't deserve. And, and hopefully your testimony, your story isn't as dramatic as John's. But I do pray that the result, the end result would be the same. Because when Jesus on the cross declared that it is finished, Jesus reconciled the world back to God. 
And each of us has received this gift from God. For we are children of grace. The scriptures say, for by grace we have been saved through faith. God gives grace to the humble. We are justified by grace. We will be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And his grace is sufficient for all our needs. And that's why it's so amazing. But as I mentioned earlier, the gift needs to be opened We have each received the present, but we need to open it and apply it to our lives. And if you've realized that throughout all your life you conceptually understood what it meant to be saved by grace, but but really you're still trying to earn your salvation, this is an opportunity to open that gift. Let's calm our hearts as I close in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, your grace truly is amazing. To think that you would leave heaven, Jesus. so that we could have a path back into a right relationship with the Father just boggles my mind. And it's, it is hard to conceptualize, especially when we've been taught all our lives that we need to earn, earn, earn. But Lord, at this time, we choose to receive this gift, this present, and to fully open up the the package and to be washed by your grace. And in your grace, we are invited into this beautiful relationship with you. But Lord, we, we really don't know what that means. So we ask, Lord, that you would open our minds to understand how beautiful this relationship is supposed to be. It's not a Sunday morning thing, Lord. It's supposed to be a a constant, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days in a year, every year thing. So teach us, Lord. You ask us to ask you, So we are. Teach us what it means to live in this grace. Because it's in your grace that we are changed from glory to glory into the image of your son, Jesus the Christ. But it's only done through your Holy Spirit. So we submit ourselves to you. We surrender our lives to you. And we ask you to just continually reveal yourself. Reveal your power. Reveal our next steps. Empower us to take those steps, Lord. We thank you also for the opportunity to join you in prayer, to intercede for our brothers and sisters. Because even before we, we come to you, you know exactly what we need and what we're going to pray for, Lord. But still, you instruct us to do so. That's what we do at this time, Lord. We lift up our family members. Go ahead, church. Lift them up by name. Lift up every single brother, sister, uncle, aunt, mom, dad, your children who need God's grace in their lives right now. And we believe that there's power in prayer, Lord. That's why we pray. That's why we humble ourselves And acknowledge that we need you. We need your power to go before us and do the work necessary in our family members' hearts, our friends' hearts, our co-workers' hearts, 
Even our enemies, Lord, we pray for them at this time. Because you instruct us to. We pray for our brothers and sisters in this church who need you. Ben, Lord, the tumor keeps growing in his brain. And we pray and we lift him up to you right now and ask that that tumor shrink in Jesus' name. That tumor become benign in Jesus' name. Through the power of the blood of Jesus that he shed on the cross, we believe that he will be healed. I lift up my sister Beverly to you as well. And Harold and Frank and Paul and Richard and Dorothy and Patricia and Rick Pray for everyone who needs physical healing right now, Lord. In Christ's name, we plead your blood to restore, to regenerate the cells that are dying, that are rebelling, rebelling from your perfect order. And through our faith, we believe, we believe, Lord. We pray for our relationships right now. We choose to forgive because we have been forgiven. We choose for your power to inspire us and to go make amends, but also to keep healthy boundaries where boundaries are needed. We pray for our finances right now. Lord, the market's going nuts again but in all things you're in control so we trust you yeah we truly do Lord for you are a loving God you are a gracious God and everything else that's on our hearts that's heavy on our hearts we lift up to you the big and the small because we know that you hear us we know that you love us we know that you care and we know that you are amazing We lift up these prayers to you in Christ's name. Amen and amen.